Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA. Thank you for joining us. The local time, he brazenly says, without even seeing a 4 5 by 5 yet. That's how confident I am lately. The local time is 8.49 in the morning, and we'll begin our program at 9 o'clock sharp. That's about 11 minutes from now. It's a Saturday morning here in Ellensburg. I see 5 by 5 thank you. Um, it's so great that you're with us today, and looks like we already have 250 people ready to go. Um, and I understand why. It's Saturday morning, and also we have a very special uh, pair of guests today. So, um, where are you viewing from? Can I say hi to a few of you? Uh, Helena is in Stockholm, Sweden. Hello, Helena. And Sonoma, California. Troy, Michigan. Derbyshire, UK. Finland. Hello. Tava 14 or something like that. Scrolled by already. Aberdeen, Scotland. The, uh, the Netherlands, another Scotland. Oh, we have a, a, a global audience today. That's terrific. Just scrolling by. Hubbard, Oregon, Los Angeles, California, Lake Chelan, Washington, Payson, Arizona, uh, Kirkland, Washington. <laughs> suddenly, suddenly everything's in Washington after I said global, whatever. Uh, I, I see all of you uh, scrolling by here so quickly. It's just terrific. Uh, Erfurt, Germany, Squaw Valley, California, Guadalajara, hello, Pato Productions, that's kind of fun. Uh, hello from up north here in the USA. Hotel Papa 100, what's up, homie? What's homie? Yeah, man, Rheinfeld in Switzerland. Edmonton, Alberta, hello, Dale. Jordan Lake, North Carolina, hello, Philip. Murumbina, uh, Australia, hello. Uh, Garrett. The Dutch night owl from the Netherlands. Zabra still in Baja, Mexico. Red Deer, Alberta. Foggy uh, Seattle. Yeah, I had beautiful pink skies here in Ellensburg. We've had sun for the last couple days and looks like today as well. A welcome relief. We've been socked in with fog and low clouds for feels like weeks. So just terrific to see that. Regine says hello from France. Well, hi, Regine. And that reminds me, let me email our two guests. Um, add the guest, copy the link, paste the link in an email going to both Karin and Mitch, convert to a plain link, so let's be hopeful there. Vizalia, California. Um, ah, let me just do the uh, schedule real quick with you guys because I'm going to be, well, you'll hear. I've totally scrapped my plan like seven minutes ago. So I think I'm going to give you the schedule now. I'm feeling free freewheeling this morning. I'll probably regret it, but... Uh, so this is session R here in January of 2023, and please come back if you like to session S on Wednesday, January 25th at 2 p.m. That's Stephen Johnston from Edmonton, Alberta. And then our last show in January will be a week from this morning with Bob Hildebrand coming in from Tucson, Arizona. And then, yeah, we've got six more shows scheduled for February before we get to the end of the alphabet. I, th I think I have everything set up except for the last two shows. I still don't know what I'm doing for Y and Z. I got papers everywhere. Uh, probably won't use most of them, but somehow it just makes me feel happy that they're there. Feel happy? What? There's backcountry Gary. Looks like Jerome is in the house. Jerome, hello. Are you done with your hellish term, Jerome? Do you have a little bit more free time now? I hope so. Say hi to a few more of you as we wait for our guests to show up in the green room. 
Half Moon Bay. Ray says things are drying out down there in the San Francisco Bay Area. That's nice to see. Uh, Charles is in Prosser, Washington. Squim, Washington. San Diego. That's Nina uh, down there. Says, uh, uh, good morning, Nick and the gang from us in sunny San Diego. Matt's in Vancouver, Washington. Jeff's in Chiclayo. Looking forward to an informative interview. Oh, I, I have confidence today that uh, if the technology works for us, we will have a a real treat. Um, okay, uh, Lori's in Phoenix, Oregon, not Arizona. The original neon cat is in Norwich, UK. Grandpa Carl in the Granger Clay Picks. Uh, Peter is in Dayton, Ohio. John's in Edmonds, Washington. Jay Smart says he's looking over the edge of the Craton in Bishop, California. That'll come up today, Jay. I miss Bishop. I haven't been to Bishop in a decade, and I used to know that area very well. I'd like to come back just to see it all again. The papers are there. Ivana, hello. I won't make fun of you this morning, Ivana. You can, you can say whatever you want, and it's just wonderful. It's great to have you with us from New York City, I guess, huh? Brooklyn, something like that. Uh, Vinman's Bakery, you've got to love it. Jeff's in the Jeff's in the house. Okay, where are our guests? It's five minutes to the top of the hour. Did that email go out? Oh, boy. Okay, let's try it again. Uh, give me a second, would you? I don't know what's going on with email, but Mitch is like, hey, we're going to get the link or not? Let me paste the link to Karin using my Google mail. There she is. Hi, Karin. You're in the green room. That's wonderful. I guess there was a little bit of a delay, maybe uh, leaving campus or something. So Mitch just emailed me and says, hey, man, where's the link? So it eventually got to you, Karin, so that's wonderful. So I can see you in the green room and just settle in for, I don't know, 15 minutes, I think. Okay, don't need to email Karin. I'm going to try Mitch <laughs> one more time. Oh, no, there's Mitch. Hey, Mitch. All right, good. All right. Yeah, just a little bit of a delay with, of course, we have a special geology server here in the building that's not part of the campus, and sometimes that gets us in trouble. Okay, delightful to have both of our guests in the audience. I can relax about that. Mitch will be sharing his screen and putting that also in the green room. Um, it's a visual morning. I, I don't want to steal my thunder here from the top, but uh, we're going to be in for a treat. Uh, to visualize uh, what's going on. The chalkboards aren't going to do much for us, I don't think, except for me kind of carrying a couple of narratives over from, what am I doing? I'm already starting the program. Shut up. I'm talking to myself. Dixie Doodle says, take several breaths, relax. Well, thank you. I'm excited today. So I'm going to do a hot mic and just try to get my, yeah, I'll do what you say, Dixie. Thank you. Uh, Lindsay, backcountry Lindsay. Yes, thank you. Okay, it's, uh, it's, uh, I have about two minutes before we're going to start. We have both of our guests in the green room, and um, more than 500 are with us, and people continue to roll in. Thank you for the encouragement in the live chat. I'm sweating for some reason. <laughs> okay. Like, literally, it's usually cold in this room. Okay, give me two minutes and we'll begin our program. Thank you. Hot mic. Oh, my goodness. Whoo. Okay, do you go to the laptop before the guests? I think the answer is no. Um, you're doing, what are you doing? You're doing two things with your, with your scrapped plan. 
right? You're bringing in whale talk. Go to that chalkboard. You're going to the old grainy chalkboard and just doing a very basic introduction. You have two experts. They're the people who will take it. You don't have to do any teaching about their expertise. That's why they're here. But you're doing the chalkboard thing for folks who are brand new to Karn and Mitch. Right. So of course it's going to be quick, but it's also going to be boiled down to the most simple aspects of what they have to share with us. And then we go where they want to go. Relax. Relax. You can do this. You really are sweating. What? <laughs> What's that about? Hey, Technology is fine. Everything's everything's good. You don't have to worry about that. Just do your thing. Three chalkboards. Props. Okay. You can do it. Good morning, one and all. Good evening, one and all, depending on where you are viewing from around the world. Thank you for joining us for this session. My label, Fixed Archipelago with Karin Siglock and Mitch Mahalanuk. And uh, right off the bat, let's make sure we know that Karin, uh, up until last year and a half or so, was at University of Oxford in England, but she has moved. And you remember Karin was with us last winter, if you saw that show. Uh, and she's now in the south of France. And uh, we're going to live stream uh, from her uh, home in France on a Saturday evening. So especially grateful to her for spending some time with us on the weekend. Uh, same for Mitch, who is up in Victoria, British Columbia. So we have two guests today, and they're, they're a dynamic duo. And we're going to get the backstory on how those two geologists and geophysicists and different specializations got together, what, motiv what motivated them to write some rather significant papers in the last decade and a half. Well, I've already visited with Karin last winter, so we're not going to just rehash that stuff. This is our first time with Mitch, but, you know, there have been two separate programs that we have done over the last couple of years with this uh, tomography and tomotectonics and uh, westward subduction. So I, I can't just go back and do all that all again. Uh, that's going to waste some of our time. It's going to waste our guest time as well. So instead... I want to use a couple props just to get some ideas going. I want to do a couple of, um, I had a plan walking in here an hour and a half ago. I scrapped it about seven minutes ago. So I got a whole new plan that's, that's cut down. But let's get to it, and then we'll go to our guests within the next 15 minutes. That's the plan. So this is my favorite sample of serpentinite that's 162 million years old. And I collected it. Uh, from the Blewett Pass area, a half an hour north of Ellensburg, Washington. It's part of the Ingalls Ophiolite. It's 162 million years old. I think I already said that. Green, waxy rock. Well, when I think of green, waxy rock, I think of this fellow, Eldridge Moores. Never met him. Passed away a few years ago. UC Davis. And I have been reading uh, uh, about uh, the career of Eldridge Moores with this special paper, 552. And um, Eldridge was suggesting 50 years ago the concept of an archipelago, a group of islands out in the Pacific off the coast of North America. And I'm not sure he was clear on the idea that maybe that archipelago was fixed, and I'll explain in a second. Uh, but th this, is, this is an older idea, and Eldridge uh, worked at least with Karn a little bit, I know, maybe Mitch as well. Um, again, just trying to get some concepts for our, our, our folks who are not totally into this world. So the idea is, if I have a serpentinite, 
just north of Ellensburg, Washington, there's a lot of it. There's a lot of Ophiolite just north of Ellensburg at the, at the base of Mount Stewart, like right over there. Remember Randy in the last show? He's like, where's all the Ophiolite? Well, we've got a bunch right here. Uh, you know, to Randy's point, there's not huge amounts of Ophiolite everywhere, I don't think. But the Ophiolite is, is, is being formed at a seafloor spreading center. I think that's a conventional message. And so I'm holding that piece of Ophiolite and I'm holding a piece of the ocean floor that's part of an old seafloor spreading center like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge today. But it's a 162 million year old seafloor spreading center in the Pacific somewhere. It's not on the ocean anymore. It's part of the North American Cordillera. Like with the basal tick-off show, we are getting away from an idea of a steady eastward motion of a huge Farallon plate. And we're getting away from the idea, I think, of bringing the intermontane terrain in on the Farallon plate 170 million years ago and the insular superterrain 100 million years ago and having it be a nice, simple story. This is what I've been teaching for the first 20 years of my career, but I'm changing that. I have changed it in the last five years based on the work of our guest today and others. Okay, how can I use the chalkboards? I want to try to get this message across to you the best that I can in, uh, in, in a, just a, a few words. Can you even make sense of this? This is the surface of the earth. This is the crust of the earth, the upper mantle, the lower mantle, and the core. This is a cross section. I know I have an old map of Washington. Try to disregard it. Here's depth, 70 kilometers, 670 to 1,900 kilometers depth. Here in the lower mantle is some ribbon candy. Ribbon candy, a slab, ocean floor that still exists from between 100 million years ago and 200 million years ago. And I think we can do that math if we assume a 10 millimeter per year steady sinking rate of this ribbon candy and have it fold up on top of itself. Our guests today have written major papers taking these discovered slabs that are thick, that are thousands of kilometers long, north-south, and bringing them back up to the surface. But this ribbon candy, this oceanic slab in the lower mantle, not discovered, I don't think, by, by Karin, but the resolution, the concepts, the meaning, the tectonic meaning between Karin and Mitch helps us get a sense of how this has anything to do with Baja BC, or at least how this has anything to do with the exotic terrain history of the North American uh, Cordillera. So this thing is beheaded, meaning it does not continue all the way up to the Earth's surface. It's been pinched off. It's been cut off. It's been lopped off. And this thing continues to sink at this steady rate down through the lower mantle. There is another one of these guys that's also at that depth called the Cascadia Root. It's another piece of ribbon candy, but this one does continue up to the present Pacific Ocean Basin. So this appears to be, I think everyone is agreeing, the Farallon Plate that's still subducting today, the Juan de Fuca, you know, going down and contributing to this. But then what the hell is this? The concept that I, we're going to keep coming back to with, we got animations today. Mitch is going to just roll with these animations. And Karin and Mitch are going to talk about them as they play them. This is the, the, the idea that I had 15 minutes ago. This is North America. We're walking around up here. Here's Seattle on the West Coast. Here's North Amer uh, New York City on the East Coast of the United States. Okay, but let's just North America as a whole. Today, today, this mystery beheaded slab, this ribbon candy in the lower mantle that doesn't continue to the surface, today it's beneath New York City. Today, it's beneath the continent of North America, underneath the East Coast, and it's maybe the biggest ocean slab down there in the lower mantle. Maybe it's the biggest in the world. Not sure, but it's a big one. Karn and Mitch say, if we go back in time, and therefore, if we move North America back to it was in the Mesozoic before 100 million years ago, this thing is underneath the Pacific. It's offshore of North America. 
And so moving North America from, let's say, 170 million years ago until today, we go back in time. Why do we have this thing dropping so suddenly in the Pacific? This is the easiest cartoon to follow, I think. If you have this thing that we're talking about, this beheaded ribbon candy in the Pacific, you're going to behead it because you have North America plowing into a fixed insular superterrain. It's beheaded because we stopped the westward subduction where North America is welded into that moving material. We cut it off. A picture's worth a thousand words. And I'm already feeling like I'm too wordy. I'm going to go to my other two chalkboards and I'm done. Going to you real soon. In the previous few episodes, what have we been talking about? We've been talking about whales. And this is my best way to try to break down the alphabet so far. And before Christmas especially, we were visualizing the whale. The whale being the insular superterrain moving three times further north than the intermontane. And all these folks, Ted Irving, Jane Wynn, Basil Tickoff, Bernie Hausen, are visualizing the insular superterrain moving quite a bit farther north than the intermontane. The hit and the run. This is the hitty, and this is the thing that's running north between 85 and 55 million years ago. I still don't know what to do with the intermontane. It's not the focal point, I don't think, of this group. Maybe I'm mistaken by saying that, but... Most of the attention for us has been the whale migrating north up the west coast of North America between 85 and 55. Well, starting with the Brian Mahoney show before Christmas and our most recent episode on Wednesday afternoon, Randy Ankin and Brian Mahoney see, and they say pretty strongly, that there's all sorts of evidence that these two guys got together. They hooked together. The insular and the intermontane welded together in the Jurassic, I mean, so suddenly we're thinking about the Mesozoic and we're thinking about the Jurassic time, long before Basil's big hit 100 million years ago. And I'm like, really? And they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Most people see it. That was Randy, I think, saying that in the last episode. So both Randy and I independently came up with this concept of mega whale, which I still can't get over. And Randy... Enkin and Brian Mahoney say, we need these two guys joined at the hip, but we need Insular down, according to the Paleomeg, south of the Sierra Nevada Triad, or the California Triad. And so if you're going to take Insular and have it down there, you need Intermontane down there as well. And they say, we don't have the Paleomeg in the Intermontane to have it south of the Sierra. The farther south we can get this mega whale is double parked next to today's Sierra Nevada Baffles. And so these guys do not like the 3,000 kilometers worth of northward transport because they have this bulky, huge mega whale to deal with. They don't see it uh, likely that that's happening. Where do our guests today fall between those two camps? We don't really need camps, but like, are they liking intermontane and insular welded or not? Are they mega whale people or the whale people? Well, last comment, we're coming to our guests. Archipelago, group of, Archipelago, group of islands, fixed. Instead of ocean plates coming towards North America and subducting eastwardly beneath North America and having these terrains come in one at a time and smash onto the edge, which again is what most of us have been teaching for a long time, because of the ribbon cotton, because of the ribbon candy, and Karn and Mitch having ribbon candy beneath each of these fixed island arcs, yes, one of them being insular. The concept then is let's take these ribbon candy, huge ocean slabs, 
which have to be from a steady fixed location where we have westward subduction of Mescalera ocean floor or Angeachem ocean floor. In other words, we have to get rid of this ocean floor somehow to bridge this, the gap between North America and these islands. But the key point is you bring North America into the picture and you have North America be this big snow plow that's just plowing into this fricking archipelago. And notice that this is a story where we, the intermontane has already been accreted. I think Mitch's specialization is saying 170. Mitch can correct me in just a second. He said, get us on. What are you doing? I can't, I can't hold it. This, is, this stuff is so good. But this is the concept we want when we look at these animations. Data from the lower mantle getting material back up to the Pacific more than 100 million years ago fixing these terrains in their position. In other words, for the first time from this tom uh, tomography evidence, we have the longitude of these exotic terrains. That's never been done. Paleomag can't do that. Paleomag can help us with latitude, but not longitude. This work from the lower mantle fixes the locations of these guys. And I bring it back to how we started. This ophiolite material just north of Ellensburg is the result of taking some of this ocean floor material with a seafloor spreading in it and getting it up onto North America because we're actually going to subduct the leading edge of the continent and allow some of that seafloor stuff to get thrust up on top of the leading edge. I'm going to bring in Karn first. Then I'm going to bring in Mitch, and then we'll go where they want to go. He goes to the headphones. Whew. We go to the south of France and try to find a friend. Can we find her on a Saturday evening? Hello, Karen. Hello, Nick. How are you? Very good. Well, you did you did your work, my work for me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we need it again with with your with your detail. I mean, it's it's just wonderful. I'm just so we can we can we can get into it, but like I'm just I keep coming back to those papers and I keep learning as I read, and it's just I still don't have it, but I, I'm getting closer each time. Um, that's very, yeah. that's very kind of you. <laughs> it's very nice for you to say that. Well, I'm, I'm thrilled well, to be here because it was a lot of fun last time and I look forward to this. Well, thanks. Let me ask one thing then. Yeah, so what's happened? Do you have a couple highlights from your work in the south of France since we saw you last January? I know you were talking about deploying some new instruments maybe in the oceans. How's that been going? Yeah. Um, yes, I mean, basically the reason I moved to France was to push the instrumentation of the oceans for, for geophysics, for seismology. And so um, we haven't, well, we're in the process of building a new generation of, of autonomous floats for the oceans, you know, building hardware, it's, that's a slow thing. But, but yes, and we're on our way and we're testing them and it's exciting. Well, it is. And I, I'm, I'm so looking forward to continuing to follow your work. One last comment before we bring in Mitch. I, I rewatched your your interviews that we did. I guess I guess it was just the last last year. Did you enter the world of geology in two thousand one? Basically, twenty years ago when you started your PhD at Princeton. What uh, I didn't I didn't catch your question. Did you uh, start your uh, work in geology about twenty years ago in two thousand one at Princeton? Yes, exactly. So before that, I was uh, I was an electrical engineer. Okay. So I was dealing I was dealing with electromagnetic waves rather than seismic waves, and Thank and uh, I started geology at Princeton. Yeah. Is my audio okay for you, or am I cutting out a little bit for you? It's excellent. Yeah. It's okay. Good. good. Well, let's keep you here, uh, Karen. Let's try to bring in Mitch from the right side and see if we can get the three of us on, on screen at the same time. So let's bring in Mitch from Victoria, British Columbia. Hello, Mitch. Hey, Nick. Good to be here. 
It's great to have you here. Thank you for joining us. How are you feeling this morning? <clears throat> Not bad, thanks. Okay, good. Um, we're, the, we're meeting you for the first time. British Columbia Geological Survey. Has it been a full career with that that outfit, Mitch? For the most part, I've I've taken a few gigs uh, other elsewhere, but uh, I've spent a large part of my career mapping the geology of British Columbia. And and do you, so, in addition to just being a field mapper, which areas? Are, do you kind of specialize in? Are you mostly an intermontane, super terrain person, or is that too restrictive to say? That? I, I've I've worked all over the province. So my I, I started my career mostly focusing in the northwest, in uh, where all these terrains converge together, and you have Cache Creek and Stikinia and Yukon Tana and Quenelle. Um, but since then, I've sort of spread out and, and and worked in the southern part of the province. Currently, I'm working in the southeast part of the province on that transition between the Intermontane Super Terrain and the Rocky Mountain Fold and Frost Belt. It's known as the, the Omanika Belt, the, 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 the Kootenai Terrain, if you will. Before you met Karin, um, were you thinking tectonically very differently than you have in the last 15 years? Uh, good question, yeah. <laughs> how do you how do you synthesize that? But anyway, I'm just curious. Like, in an answer, yeah, I, I mean, it's been definitely a game changer looking at the the tech, the tomography and integrating that with what we thought we knew about tectonics. Um, you know, it's, there are still a lot of things that that don't make sense to us. A lot of work yet to be done, but yeah. I I feel we've made some great progress. Well, I do too, and I'm excited to have you guys just go crazy here in the next few minutes. But before we do that, um, would you mind telling us the story back and forth between the two of you on, on how this collaboration started? Was it Mitch that you, you kind of reached a dead end with, with certain relationships and you needed a new collaborator? Or how did this start, this, this work between the two of you? Well, maybe since I reached out first, I should I should start here. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. I part part of my regional mapping hat is uh, getting a handle on the resource potential of, of the province. So you know, framework geological mapping is used for a lot of things, from citing roads to you know deciding where to put parks, but also to try to inventory the the resources economic resources of the province and part of in part of doing that is trying to understand uh, get a pretty complete picture of of how the province was put together geologically and when we looked at or at the adj our adjacent jurisdiction the united states we see yeah. in the u.s all these big Porphyry deposits. Now, porphyry deposits are are these intrusions that come up, and they're laden with unusually rich amounts of what we're interested in copper, mostly, but also also molybdenum and silver and other gold and other elements. Mm -hmm. um, and and there's a whole belt of young porphyry deposits in the U.S. that are huge. These are uh, Bingham. Butte, uh, and they, they sit like a thousand kilometers from the active plate margin. And mm -hmm. we have nothing like that in British Columbia. So mm. try to understand why that was the case. Uh, I went searching and, and, and found, came across Karen's papers. Now she had just written a paper in 2011 on on uh, sort of mantle, mantle provinces beneath North America, which I found incredibly insightful and beautifully written. And I thought, well, maybe tomography is the way to go. You know, it will, will provide us some answers to why we have this rich, very uh, far inboard belt of a porphyry deposits in the U.S. and why we don't yet know where they are in B.C. or where we might look 
in British Columbia for this belt of, of deposits. And so I contacted Karen sort of under the guise of inviting her for a talk, um, but also, you know, fairly self-serving. I, I wanted to, to learn from her and yeah. uh, to pick her brains on where we might, you know, how we might use her beautiful models. I mean, there was comparing the models that she had generated with anything else that I could find in the literature. Um, it was it was obvious to me as a as a non expert in tomography that you know I I had to learn more about about these models that she was using. And the, the other thing that was happening at the time is G plates had just been released. So I think it uh, in 2011, the, the first version kind of went public and I was playing with that. And what I wanted to get my hands on was a, a georeferenced version of her, of her models that I could put into G plates and, and then play with it. At the time I had no idea what I was doing, but, uh, <laughs> But Karen helped me out with that. And now, now you have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Still don't totally. know. <laughs> well, Karen, I'm, I'm, cur I'm curious, Karen, like um, those early papers, were you hearing from a bunch of geologists? Like, whoa, th this is amazing. Like, I need to start working with you. Or was Whit Mitch like one of the only guys to like come out of the woodwork, essentially? No, no, there were, there were other geologists, but... Um, you know, I, I, I think, um, I mean, this is, this is, of course, you know, maybe this is a, maybe this is a generalization or whatever, but I was yeah. talking, I was talking with, uh, with the geologists in, in the US where I was in grad school and where I had my professional network. Mm -hmm. And I think the problem is that the terrains are no longer in the US, right? So it didn't, they, they didn't make the connection. They didn't make the connection. And so um, it was like, and my first job then after grad school was in Munich. I was an assistant professor and it was lucky that Dietmar Müller, who is the PI for the G plates um, program. And also they do global plate reconstructions, which we have since used then. So he came on a sabbatical and I, I showed him, I showed him these, I showed him these tomographies and overlaid on, on his paleo GIS system. And he said, oh, that's very intriguing. It's, uh, it's really, I've never seen something quite like that. And he knows the region. Um, but he said, uh, but I mean, with those ideas of, you know, are there two subductions on, you have to talk to a terrain specialist. And I was, oh. what, a terrain specialist? And, um, and, but then um, I had, I had in grad school in 2003, I think, because I tried to tag along on field trips because I was, you know, my background was not in geology. So I tried to compensate. So Lincoln Hollister was running a field trip to, to, um, to Prince Rupert in British Columbia. Um, and, and, and he took Jason Morgan along, one of, one of the fathers of plate tectonics. And, and they were talking about these terrains and these big displacements. And I thought, Oh, that's you know I'm 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 supposed to think back to that now was is what Dietmar was saying because from that field trip I came back with the conclusion that was a hopeless mess and nothing for ge geophysicists. <laughs> I mean, but okay, so then um, okay, so then you know Dietmar had just um, made that diagnosis when Mitch contacted me and usually I wouldn't have paid a lot of attention to someone asking me if I could help him find copper mines, right? But right. because of that, I did pay attention because I had the feeling I, that's a Canadian, I might talk to him about terrains. And that, that turned out uh, the case because Mitch is actually quite a big picture thinker. Um, and it turned out he had, you know, a, a scope that went well beyond British Columbia. Well, that, that's an angle that, this is really fun, by the way, let's just keep doing this for a little bit more. Um, you know, a theme we had, especially before Christmas, I kept asking the field, some of the field geologists, why were you open to the paleo mag? Like so many were just like so different. I'm not really interested in even thinking about that. I guess I can ask you, Mitch, you're a field geologist. Like, why were you so open to this lower mantle stuff? And was, were other people yeah. open as you well, to, to looking that deep? Just like paleo mag, Nick, the, these velocity measurements are their physical properties of the earth and we need to we need to be able to integrate them into our models and our thinking uh, you know paleo mag is, is no different it's physically it's a physically measurable quantity that 
is imprinted on the rocks and mm -hmm. it's been those measurements have been reproduced multiple multiple times and it's incumbent upon us geologists to figure out how they came to be you know it's it, it really if we were to put uncertainty bars on most geological maps um those those uncertainty bars would be huge <laughs> That's an interesting phrase. Wow. Um, okay, two more things, and then we'll try the animations. If, if, if at least two more things. Um, so, when did you guys actually physically meet, or were you starting to collaborate over email or whatever? Like you even write your first major paper. I'm aware of of you guys jointly. It was 2013. Is that a, a long distance relationship? Yeah. Yeah, we, we wrote that paper without having met physically. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and this is before Zoom and stuff, or I don't oh. know, are you having video calls? Yeah, yeah. I mean definitely Skype. I don't remember it was okay. Zoom, but probably yeah. Skype. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How did that 2013 paper differ from the 2017 paper? Those feel like both major papers. Uh, I think I only have, viewers, I have five things waiting for you, and we'll go to it after we're done visiting with these guys. I don't have the 2013 paper posted, but the 2017 one I do. Um, how do you guys view, Mitch, how do you view those two papers differently, the 2013 and the 2017? Well, the 2013 paper was a concept paper, and because of the venue, we, we couldn't really flush it out very much. And the two, 2017 paper was, it, it was obvious that we needed to, put more geological background behind that, the, those ideas. And, and the GSA bulletin venue provided us with that opportunity. So mm -hmm. they, they're complementary in many ways. And where does Eldridge Moores fit into this personally for either of you? Were there visits, were there Skype calls, or were you just reading Eldridge's stuff and getting some ideas that way? Well, the sad thing is, you know, I in, on that field trip of British Columbia, they did talk about Eldridge Moores, who also went to grad school in Princeton and was a bit older than uh, Jason Morgan and, and Lincoln Hollister. So <laughs> I should have known better, um, but uh, I didn't make the connection. I met, I then met uh, yeah. Eldridge in, in 2012 at a, at a, because they are always running these um, uh, PhD reunions. And uh, and uh, it was, we hadn't quite written the paper yet, but we're, we're well on our way. And there were actually from Eldridge's generation also a couple of other PhDs um, in the audience who were very fixist or um, also, also big names in Canada. And, uh, and Eldridge got very excited. <laughs> Um, where, where, where some other people said, oh, you must be missing some plagues or so. Um, Agrish got very excited, but he also asked uh, if if we were just mopping up after the plate tectonic revolution or if there was really something new coming. But we, um, we I mean, we've hugely enjoyed um, and benefited from from um, talking with Eldridge after that over the years. And, and uh, we're... In <laughs> eternally you know grateful for him that that he that he led a trip to the Sierra Nevada for us because that that is a that is a really um crucial crucial test or crucial point where people say it doesn't work in the Sierra Nevada and there's so much geologists have worked in the Sierra Nevada so it was very important that Eldridge took us to the Sierra Nevada and showed us around. Eldridge and, and just the two of you, or was it a much bigger field trip that you're speaking? It was about? also Rob Coe, one of those horrible Baja BC um, paleomagnetists. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, we're going to see some Baja BC in at least one of the Edward Clinette uh, animation, I know. Um, Mitch, do you want to try to share your screen here? I don't see it yet in the green room. Oh, uh, I will do that. Yeah, thank you. We'll and, and we'll just we'll just freelance here. Viewers, we're going to come to you, but it's going to be a while. I, you know, I mean, it's nine thirty ish, and I, I'm hoping we can just have these guys talk as we look at some of these animations, the G plate stuff, the, um, and we can start. I see something in the green room. I'm going to bring yeah. it in when you're ready. Um, um, what I wanted to do is. I kind of want to need to show a photograph 
here of the folded snow. I don't, I, I have the most, the it, most it's, heavy. it's okay. I, I've got it too. Okay. Well, yeah. okay. The most handy version I have is this slide, but it, there's a lot of other stuff on this slide. So, uh, okay, so you see it here. All right. I'd actually never seen that ribbon candy, so that's very beautiful, Nick. Ah, um, thank you. I just, I, I just wanted to say we don't, we don't, we're not, we don't, can't say for sure that the slabs are doing this. Um, it's just clear that they are thickened, and that's what tomography sees. And the physicists say that this, the, the geodynamic modelers say that this is what's most likely happening. And it's basically a traffic jam. There's stuff, mm -hmm. there's lithosphere coming in from the surface much quicker than it can sink away. Or even if the trench is um, moving, there's still not enough accommodation space. And so it have to, has to somehow bunch together, and that's probably mm -hmm. what it does. But um, cool. the, the important thing is that it's a lot of lithosphere and that takes time, right? So it doesn't, uh, typically a plate converges on a trench at five centimeters per year. That's what we know. And so there's also a sort of a speed limit to that. And so if you see volumes and volumes of lithosphere, it means it's old, right? Yeah. And, and that, that, was a, that changes the view because, because people tended to think what we're seeing here is not what you showed or, folded or bunched up slab, but a single lithosphere. And that would be much younger, you know, by the oh. se several factors younger. And that is actually a key um, because, because we're basically saying these um, things are older than people had assumed. And so we're going back further in time and looking at them. The mantle has a longer memory than we thought. Interesting. Yeah, uh, I, yeah let, let's, let's do some visuals. And then I would like, if you guys are willing, to get into a little bit of the pushback that you've received, uh, if you want to, I don't know. Let's sure. let's go back to what Mitch has got. Okay, Mitch. Yeah. So the idea we just wanted to start off with a reminder to people, and this is just pulled off the DNAVCO website yesterday. Uh -huh. uh, that we we do live on here in in Northwest U.S. and West Coast of Canada. We do live on an active plate boundary, and we can measure those motions, right? So we can see that. We can see, for example, that that everything that sits basically west of the San Andreas Fault is is largely coupled with Pacific Plate and moving with the Pacific Plate. And you can see in the north, or sorry, in the, the southwest corner of the, the map, that's that's 25 centimeters per year, that, that length of that arrow. So you know this these these this part of of US, any everything basically west of san francisco bay is is moving with the pacific plate at about 70 um, millimeters per year uh, mm -hmm. with the pacific plate and and eventually we'll get stuffed beneath the uh the Aleutian subduction zone if the plate configuration doesn't change before then so yeah it's it in my view of the world like in our view of the world it, it's it's you know, very mobilistic, and we have to always consider that when we're looking back in time as well. You know, does it make sense to have an unchanging continental margin for tens or, or hundreds of millions of years where you just have um, sort of accordion style? Right. Emergence? When yeah. we know from the, from the, the isochrons and the ocean floors that, that that wasn't the case. So anyway. Good. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, and I, I think the other thing that we wanted um, to show, you know, what's an archipelago or what do we mean by this? Um, it, it's, it's also a, a thing that, that is, um, has been pointed out almost at the plate tectonic, uh, at the time of the plate tectonic revolution, though Eldridge Moore saw it in his mind's eye, uh, Warren Hamilton, uh, Bill Dickinson. Um, it's a very watery world. It's a very, um, it's, it's, there's, there's terrains, but there's also a lot of water and a lot of space between it. And so nothing is very tightly coupled in the beginning. And so maybe Mitch can bring up, they, they've, they've early on, they've pointed out the, um, the analogy to the Southwest Pacific that yeah. is operating today. And, um, and so we always thought that was sort of a, like a cartoon thing and, um, and that's how they used it. But, but, but 
suddenly uh, you know, to Mitch um, realized that actually the analogy is even even closer than we thought. And so we're not not going into detail, but it would be it would be nice to just in 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 you the you know the, the audience's heads um, see this. Um, and you can you can open your own Google Maps and and um, look at turn on the satellite view and look at the area between Australia, Indonesia, Japan, and and Tonga, and just let that sink in with the satellite view. How complicated that all is. Yes. And it's um, and we've here um we've here plotted the analogy. So we'll we'll get back to this um, we'll get back to this left. Part, which is how North America moved from the right in the in the in the panel A. Over time, mm -hmm. it moved to its present position through the west. But on the other um, plot, we've rotated the the current map um, of Australia, and and we've mirror imaged it to show um, Australia. It's labeled North America, which is actually quite a close and analogous um, situation of what it used to be 120 million years roughly ago. Mm -hmm. So this is Australia plays a similar role as North America and position as North America had 120 years ago. And what you can see here is that it uh, just is moving. It's moving to the left in this picture. Um, behind it is a label Atlantic. Now, in reality, that's the Southern Ocean. It it uh -huh. drifted away from Australia, uh, from Antarctica, yeah. a few tens of millions of years ago, and it's on its way. And so, it, Australia, in absolute terms, is going north in this picture because it's rotated. It's going to the left, and it's it's hitting a a, a long line of trenches, which is these red ones and the and the orange ones, it's the Sunda trenches, the red ones, and then the Coral Sea trenches. And these Coral Sea trenches, the orange ones, they turn out to be a close analogon to the inter insular super terrain <laughs> place. So that's why it it's is, labeled. It, it, is has a, it, has a, <laughs> it is It is actually surprisingly complete. Yeah. And then there are some more trenches. Those are the green ones. And those are the Farallon trenches. They are really the Pacific trenches. So it's really the Pacific plate that's labeled o Farallon Ocean. It's today's Pacific that's coming in from, in absolute terms, from, well, from the east in, mm -hmm. in, on the real map. But here it's coming in from the side, um, almost at a right angles, which, mm -hmm. which drive you know, Baja BC motion. It's, you can see these black arrows that are pointing topwards, northwards. Um, that they are almost parallel to these um, to these red and orange trenches, and and they are coupling mm. into Papua New Guinea, which is um, which is labeled IMS. That's the intermontane. So Papua New Guinea is the intermontane superterrain, but it's already accreted a little part of um, uh, the screen, uh, the, this red orange trench, which previously used to be one single line before Australia collided with it. So mm. Australia has started colliding with this long line of red, red orange trenches and is now accreting terrains here. And the point is, yeah, go ahead, Nick. No, I just, I, I love this. I also, I was just going to interject that like, Mitch is a maestro there. He's pulling up exactly the right slide at the right time. Like, I don't know, he's got everything ready to go. So I'm interrupting needlessly. Please continue, Karin. So the, the point is just um, it, it, it's, it's a very complex situation, but it's not something that we invented. It's, it's something that the Earth is doing today. It's something that these um, geologists knew very early that North America was doing. So we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't fool ourselves into thinking it could be very simple. And, um, and of course it's not, and nobody does, but imagine if, if Australia keeps doing this for 120 years, keeps riding like North America did, then it'll end up adjacent to Japan or something like that. And it'll have accreted everything in between to its margins or shoved it aside or something. And so then just imagine geologists 120 million, million years in the future of how much of all this will they be able to reconstruct? Yeah. It's, it won't be possible to do every detail, but certain, but certain big 
patterns will be possible. And, and one of them, one important one is, is that the mantle will still have the traces of these trenches. It'll, it'll still have the subduct, the, the ocean lithosphere that's gone, where everything was squished together that, that survived at the surface. So from that, we won't have a spatial impression, but from the ocean lithosphere that's in the mantle, we can reconstruct some of this and that's what we're doing. Have slabs been found in the Australia area that we were just looking at so far? Oh yes, yes. It's um, it's just as you would expect that under each of those trenches, there's a slab forming a slab wall actually by and large. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, Mitch, looks like Mitch is back to an animation. Let's just, uh, I love that slide. Let's, uh, oh good. So this is your former student, Karen uh, Edward Clinet. Yes, so this is um this is the reconstruction. That's a quantification of the of the ideas that Mitch and I have put forward. Um, so in, in so our, our concept paper in 2013, then the geological um, you know the, the the long argument in 2017, and Edward in 2020 did his master's project on this in in the at the University of Oxford. And so he traveled to Australia to, to the group of, of Dietmar Müller, to Maria Seaton, and, and took their global plate reconstruction that is an empty Pacific, that's the mainstream model. And, and he exchanged that Northwest um, Pacific corner over the last, the, 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 the plates for the last 170 million years, he, he inserted our plates in them. And in addition, um, he put in this terrain model that a, an undergraduate student of Mitch's and Stephen Johnston's had made. So that's Martha Henderson. So she had digitized these um, almost 100 um, terrains, the terrain model of the Cordillera and uh, for present day. And so Edward worked with those terrains to make them move over time and, and uh, with consistently closing plate boundaries. So, so everything behaving to the rules of plate tectonics. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's what this is. Thank you. So why don't I run it back? To Good, the, thank you. The beginning is 170 and then we can just let it run forward. So here's the archipelago as informed by mantle tomography mm -hmm. and we can take yeah, a so look. we don't see we don't see the trench. Well, we see the trenches with these barbs, but we don't see the slabs. But where there are now these red and orange and and yellow uh, microcontinents are sitting there because there is a slab. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So just for some context, this is insular super terrain, intermontane super terrain. Um, and the Enkayuchim Ocean. We'll just see how this plays forward. <clears throat> the, the constraints are obviously geology, paleomagnetics, uh, ah. and the tomography. That's Baja BC now. It sure is. So maybe we'll just uh, go back to the big Baja BC northward movement here between 100 and just let that play again. So where all the motion occurs from 85 up to 50, Alaska assembles. And then Yakutat terrain continues to move along the coast and we have basin range extension <clears throat> opening up the Gulf of California. So the Baja BC that you're showing beautifully, is that coming from the lower mantle or is that using paleomag to accentuate what you're doing with the lower mantle or, or that, why, that, are you showing Baja, why, why are you showing Baja BC on this animation? Well, because we we used paleomag, the the irrefutable paleomag data sets, to constrain where these 
terrains must have been latitudinally. <clears throat> and but there's also, yeah. Go ahead. No, no, fin finish. Then I'll. Yeah. Well, that, that, I don't really have anything else important to add. <laughs> I mean, I think I think the answer is yes. I mean, it it, it respects all the paleo Mac, but there's a there's an independent um, observation that has nothing to do with paleo Mac and shows that this Baja BC must have happened. And it's when I mean North America, so so we can see where these slabs are, and and so then we have to we have to distribute all the accreted terrains over these slabs so that after North America runs into them slowly over 100 million years, it, it, it hoovers them up. Um, we, get the, we get the assemblage that is observed. And so we put the insular super terrain offshore. And that is the somewhat contentious part here. That's the non mainstream thing. That means we keep the suture between intermontane and insular open for longer than is usually said. Okay, but um, we can only put it such, we can only put it in a place um, that will be hit by North America about at the latitudes of where you are in the Pacific mm -hmm. Northwest or maybe a bit further south. And so the latitude of North America is constrained um, from the Atlantic side, is constrained by how the Atlantic open, Ocean opens by the hotspot. So it's, um, there's, there's a lot with that and it's completely independent. Um, of the slabs and so the fact that you know the northernmost part of insular super terrain hits in the u.s somewhere but it's it's clearly not in the u.s today it's in alaska right so so we see it must have fit in the u.s according if, okay. if, if the map story is making any sense but now it's not yes. in the u.s so even if we didn't have paleo map we would have said right this is what must have happened yes mm -hmm. i totally get that that's mm -hmm. great thank you uh Let's go back. I don't, oh, okay. All right. Okay, Mitch. So here's another view. <clears throat> this is in G plates now, which is a fantastic facility, by the way. Um, people should make use of it if they can. And just to get the point across, um, this is the slabscape beneath. Uh, this is mm. uh, derived from um, Castro Lassani's. Uh, global tomog tomographic model. Castro was a PhD student of of Kearns and and then uh, postdoc. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe we'll maybe we'll just play this again without the slapscape. Well, no, let's leave the slapscape on. <clears throat> but just see once again. So so North America here is kind of a, a, a in the animation, the margin of North America here is kind of a light gray, and you can see that it's it's impinging on this slab wall and sweeping up all of the arc terrains that were contributing to that slab wall as it continues to move to the west. So, so what Corinne was saying is if we look down into this this slabscape here, we can yeah. see that that this 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 eastward cusp of that slab wall provides us also with a latitudinal control on where that collision must have been. Now that's all contingent upon our reference frame, and you know the reference frames do change slightly with new modifications, but we have use you know we have essentially input all the reference frames into g plates and and have um tested them all and we i think we have a, a supplement in one of our papers that, that shows that uh-huh oh, we used to think this is total visual overload so we realize that you think this is total visual overload <laughs> <laughs> this took us a long time to uh to the grasp all this, but I mean, Mitch, maybe we can show the, the three D um, just the slabs and 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 take that in for a little while. How how this logic goes? Just so pull off. Yeah, from from our paper that that oblique view of oh, slabs. Yeah. Good idea. Sure, we can do that. Um, Am I right in saying that we can fix longitude for these things now? You you mentioned yes. latitude, Mitch, but 
Yes. Um, I mean, yes, you can you can fix the um, <laughs> you can fix the longitude and latitude of um, of insular super terrain. And first, we thought this is a great tool to fix the longitude and latitude of North America. But then it turned out North America was not at that slab. You know, if it had been an Andean style margin with Farallon slab, then we would have also have fixed North America. And now, you know, it turns out North America was not an Andean style margin. But in other places, this will work. Yes. In other where there are other continental blocks that are well tied to a Andean style subduction. Zone. Well, I know we're going back to more visuals in a second. Mitch has got something else queued up, but I can't hold it. Like, I'm so excited about this and your work. And why isn't everybody excited about your work? Like, if we're fixing latitude and longitude, I, I, I'm guessing people have problems with we're doing something in the lower mantle. There's no connection to the surface. You're using all sorts of assumptions. That's incorrect. Or you need eastward subduction for 120 million years straight in Eastern California. Like, is there a way just to kind of give us a sense of like why everybody here shouldn't be just like, oh my God, this is it. Like, why do we even have more letters in the alphabet? We've, we've, we've solved it. <laughs> well, I think, you know, I think you need a lot of background knowledge. I mean, for us, it, it, it took us a long time. I mean, it took me a long time to understand what Mitch knew and why they knew it. And it, we, could, we could just barely, barely talk in the beginning. And then over the months, we could talk more. And, um, and, and, that, and that's the case everywhere, right? You have to be able to evaluate the uncertainties for the tomography and the, the plausibility of the geodynamic things that we say, why the slabs would not have moved. You know? So that's the geodynamic modeling part and, um, or, or the first principles physics. You have to be able to assess um, the uncertainties in the, in the imaging, the, the geophysical imaging, the tomography. You have to understand about the uncertainties in the plate reconstructions. Where do those came, come from? What's solid and what's not so solid? And of course, um, you have to be willing to, to question um, certain interpretations from geology or really, really go back and look at, look at these, you know, these sutures. Um, well, first you have to know they are sutures. I mean, as a geophysicist, you don't even, you know. <laughs> and right. then um, that, that you might be able to pull one apart is it, especially if that's not the mainstream uh, stream view. And so you're basically trying to trade off uncertainties or, or, or understand where, where the weak point in each case might be. So that, that takes a lot of time and a lot of background knowledge. And so it's not like this would uh, be accepted overnight. I don't know. It's unrealistic. How about you, Mitch? Like, do you feel like you have colleagues who are not seeing this the way you are? I think Karen is right. It just takes time for for it to sink in, um, and a lot of people are <clears throat> fairly uncomfortable extrapolating from the mantle to the surface. You uh, and, and yeah, I, to reiterate what Karen has already said, it you know trying to read into these three dimensional, you know. Um, topologies of yeah. high velocity zones in the mantle um, and extrapolate from them the, the tectonic information that we, we think we can now, um, that that took us a, a long time. I mean, yeah. years of staring at these things and moving them back and forth in G-plates. Uh, I, I just, I'm so excited right now. Let, let's go back. I see you've got a, a pretty classic shot here either one of you want to help us as we continue viewers we're coming yeah. I'm saying another five to ten minutes viewers can you wait another five to ten and we'll come into your questions i promise okay karen yeah i just i just um wanted to give an appreciation of the of the geometries of these of these slabscapes so so where the subducted oceans are in the mantle now and you can see, um, I mean, A, they are quite elongated structures, so they still have a lot of their characteristics of the trench lines. Um, mm -hmm. What they don't have is this flat um, ocean basin-like geometry, so they're not distributed everywhere in the mantle. Rather, they are in very localized places. So they, they talk more about their trenches rather than their previous 
the ocean basins that they filled. And so also because your your show is about um, BC, Baja BC, mm -hmm. it's I, I thought it would be, you know, it, it might be reasonable to look at this a bit a bit more and think what it means for Baja BC. I mean, we're not we're not focused on Baja BC. We've basically accepted that the paleomag constraints, which are which are solid and it's a mature you know, mature discipline, mature measurements. They have to be worked in, and 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 um, and they also have to be worked in with this. So I just wanted yeah. to give a bit more of an. And I think what we can add is is to say, look, this this has been a very um, this has been a very watery world always, a very non consolidated world. And for example, if if we look at these slabs some more, we'll see that Baja BC was never um, moving around in an open Pacific basin, in an empty Pacific basin with nothing in it. Now, rather, Baja BC was, was moving within these subduction zones. So it shuffled around in, in that there's two big oceans coming in from either side, and in the middle, there's stuff going on, and one of these is Baja BC. And so that, that's Ooh. different from just saying there is a big feral on plate and it's driving Baja BC all the time. It's, and it's, it, it sounds like you're not a mega whale person then. You, you, your oceans are between intermontane and insular, right? Well, yes, until, until 145 million years. So at the time of Baja BC, they are, they are whales and they are joined. But you'll see if Mitch, Mitch shows his, uh, his animation again later. Well, maybe, maybe not right now. But but you'll see how the whales deform, especially intermontane whale. It doesn't doesn't keep its shape, so it doesn't look like a whale anymore in the end. So that's also something we can add by saying, look, there's all these terrains. Um, they're not two blocks that are moving with yeah. each other. They look very different yeah. in the beginning and in the end because everything has moved relative to everything. And and what they looked like in the beginning, we can now appreciate better because we now see the places where they were strung out and and what space how long that space must have been that they occupied. Hey, Mitch, before, we before I lose the thought, so I'm confused about the general timing. Do you like intermontane accreting 170 million years ago? And then do you see intermontane leaving North America again at a certain time and then coming back 100 million years ago? Like what, what's just the, the cartoonish timeline of intermontane and insular from your point of view? There are several lines of evidence that would suggest that Intermontane has docked at least loosely on the margin of North America by 185 million years ago. Okay. And this, this domain, this arc on the margin of North America, actually as we go southwards into southwest U.S., that arc, which, which some people refer to as the native Triassic Jurassic arc was probably rooted on continental crust. We can actually see the plutons of that arc cutting through cratonic material. So, so in you know in Triassic time, Jurassic time, we would concur with the consensus that yes, we had eastward subduction beneath you know southern southwest U.S. And eastward subduction beneath the intermontane arc complex, which then we think, or I think, collapsed and docked. And that collapse, that final collapse in British Columbia is about 173 million years ago. But that sat there at, on the margin of North America as North America um, then rifted apart from Pangaea and drifted and, and collided with, with the, in, the insular super terrain, that archipelago sitting out in, in the ocean. So, so yes, there was, or there is fairly compelling, very compelling um, geologic evidence to suggest that yes, there was an arc already on the margin of North America when it's, you know, started its journey from Pangea. And, 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 you know, what fits with this is that, okay, so the short answer then, well, what I have, the, the physicist summary of this is there's <laughs> eastward 
Andean style subduction before the archipelago. There's Andean style subduction after the archipelago. And there's even more eastward subduction, all of which that is during the archipelago. All the time there's eastward subduction, sometimes on the margin, sometimes offshore. But there's this episode in between of westward subduction. Okay, so yeah. that's the that's what we've changed. And because we've said this episode fits in, and you have to look closely because in parts of the US where, where it docked first, this episode is just 20 million years or so of westward subduction. It's much longer in Mexico. It's it's up, up to a you know it goes until 100 million years. So in total, maybe maybe 70 million years of westward subduction. And in Alaska, the beauty of our model is that it explains where the Cretaceous arcs of central Alaska come from. No, no other they they come from nowhere in the other models. They're Cretaceous. They're not that old. And yeah. for us, they are on this northern slab, and it's and we implement Stephen Stronston's terrain rec model, Alaskan terrain rec model, beautiful. You know, it takes a hundred million years to hoover up these arcs, and and so it's a perfect fit, and and they are right there. You know, the, the slab is there. But so there's always eastward subduction, but we fit yeah. in an episode of westward subduction. That and, helps. And what Mitch says is. Um, before this story starts, around 170, 180, there was an Andean style margin. And you can see it in the mantle. That is also the step where we say the story starts. The whole slab state uh, scape reconfigures. So what we're showing you is, is all of that since what we infer to be 180 million years. And deeper in the mantle, there are more slabs, but they had configured very differently. So there was a really a clean slate in a way at a certain depth which presumably corresponds to a certain time. And, and, and the, it, the story makes sense if this was 180, which is also the time where the Farallon plate starts to grow. Huh. Right. So suddenly, that's also the time in the Farallon, according to the seafloor isochrons on the Pacific plate, started to grow. So everything changes. North America starts to drift away from Pangaea at that moment, and the Farallon plate starts to grow, and uh, that's the archipelago. Terrific stuff. Mitch, can we look at maybe both animations one more time and a slide that you have queued up? And then viewers, I promise, and we might go to the animations again once we get some questions from our live viewers. But um, this is, yeah, pretty eye-catching stuff here. Let's just do a few more minutes of some visuals, just now that we've learned a little bit more backstory from you guys. Thank you. Well, this is, this is the subduction under the the Pacific Northwest, essentially the the U.S. It doesn't really go into into Canada, mm -hmm. and it's it's today. So it's it's the the little remnant of the Farallon plate that is subducting eastward today, and it's subducting under the margin. But it didn't always used to. It's only been doing that for about fifty million years, which is about mm -hmm. down to the. So what you, we're looking down in the mantle to about halfway to the core mantle boundary, so about to 1,800 kilometers depth. Mm -hmm. And so 50 million years ago would correspond to the light blue level. Okay, so everything since then has been the Cascadia arc, the Cascades arc on the, on the continent. Mm -hmm. But then as you go further back in time, North America leaves you. I mean, it, it goes out of the picture to the right. Yeah. And so, but the Farallon plate we know from the Pacific isochrons is a hundred million years old at least. And indeed, we have enough stuff here going down to the red level to account for 180 million years. But a hundred million years, 80 million years ago, the continent was way, way, way east. Yes. Yes. And that was the new thing we discovered that. People, so that was changed the interpretation that when they suddenly instrumented the US with US array, um, this, we hadn't imaged, the tomography hadn't imaged so deep, only about to the blue level. And so we just assumed this slab connected to the very easterly slabs under the East Coast. Yeah. We didn't know that it actually descended right in place and, and uh, there was enough stuff right under the Pacific Northwest to account for the whole lifetime of the Farallon. And these big other slabs that we can see, Mitch, maybe if you can go back to the other, to the other picture. So the much bigger slabs that run under the eastern seaboard of the U.S. and they run all across um, Canada. 
Sorry, I'm I'm going the wrong. Oh, there it is. <laughs> yeah. So this view is as if we're sitting on the margin of North America at 180 million years or 170 million years, and we're looking westward. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing these slabs in the mantle and, and we're seeing also the outlines of where North America ends up. So it's present position. And so in the background, you see this cascade subduction, the purple, the dark blue, and it goes down to that red time, red level, meaning red time. Mm -hmm. And it's well separate from what you see in the foreground, which is this very linear and much more massive uh, curtain. The slab walls, they are very, they really build up vertically. And um, and so then the question is, what's that? People had said, well, that's the Farallon because they didn't see the deep end of the of the cascade subduction. Must be the Farallon. Mm -hmm. And that that's true, it had to be the Farallon while you didn't see the deep end. But once we saw the deep end, the question, what's that? And and the other thing is that because we realized it was so massive. It must be older, it must be much older, it must have more lithosphere. And if you go old enough, then, then North America, just the whole continent sits east of all this, where our view. But then that means now between us, where we're sitting and, and what we're viewing there. So if you imagine you're now at 170 million years, and we're about to start our slow westward drift, We've been pulled in by these slabs, um, and that you don't. And all these slabs don't exist um, except the red level. So the dark red level that shows where the trenches were, and so there's this this lithosphere between us and those red trenches, and and we know that North America now starts drifting, and. Um, how how does that work? That means there's that sea flow must disappear. Yeah. And the only way it can disappear is by going westward into those slabs. Because it cannot disappear under us, under the Andean margin, because there is no slab observed there. And there's also no arc when you look closely, but that's the thing that people uh, we need to still convince everybody. But we right. think we have pretty well, thank you for your patience. I mean, how many times have you had to say that spiel, you know, like to explain this, you know, even for us, you've done it a couple of times. So, I mean, I, I, I don't know if you get to a point where you're just like, my God, almost like the paleo mag guys, like, what else do you want? Like, I can't say this another way. Like, why aren't you seeing all this? But we, we're, we're coming to the viewers. I think Mitch, I'm going to pull an audible. We'll, we'll, we'll call up the animations prompted by a question or two, possibly. But I think we should go. Um, if you ha guys have another 10, 15 minutes, do you? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Viewers, uppercase, please, anywhere you want to go, uh, regardless if you're a beginner thinking about this or Ivana level. Uh, <laughs> Geneva says, have you mapped old ocean slabs deep in the mantle in other parts of the world? And are you thinking of expanding your work? Either one. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I mean, yes, they are, they're everywhere. I mean, they, as, as they should, and they connect up to the active, if there's an active trench, they connect upwards as they should. And so, sure. yes, we've, so we've done a detailed assessment of, of the real Andean margin of South America which also isn't Andean forever as you go back in time. Oh, and we're wow. working on the Caribbean and Central America. And we're also thinking about the, the Eurasian, Eurasian slabs. Mm. Or we're working, working on, on a tomotectonic assessment. But yes, the slabs are, are everywhere where there's orogenies. Very cool. Let's keep it moving. Uh, Mitch, I think we're going to cue an animation here. 101 Rotary Power asks, on the accretion animation, why do the Angayacham Islands, depicted in red, appear to spin? What informs that rapid rotation in place? Maybe that's the Clinet one. Yes. Well, I, yeah. I, I, either, I don't one. either yeah. animation, but yeah. yeah, we'll just maybe we'll just play it and thank you. So let's let's go back to one seventy. 
And so th we're talking about these, this archipelago here, these, this series of, of arcs, arc terrains, which make up Alaska right now. And <clears throat> what- So that's central Alaska, that's not in the other reconstructions that has no place in other plate accountings. Mm. Mm -hmm. So if, if you look at Alaska today, Alaska has these two big oroclines, these big, this big Z of <laughs> mountain belts, and that is what's represented here. Um, we've, we've basically you know, used uh, Steve Johnston's um, uh, synopsis of, and the, of the, the geology and the paleogeography of Alaska in this animation, but that is informed by uh, paleomag and the geology as well, and and just the the shape of of the existing uh, mountain belts within Alaska. Very cool. Can we look at it again, please? Sure. Thanks. So that so it, that is the terrain wreck, the train yeah. wreck. You're setting up the next episode perfectly. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, so that that thing's fixed out there and pretty linear because it's above some ribbon candy. Yes. And then, yeah, so the question is the spin. So you've been talking about the rotation. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and just take it, like, if you have your Google Earth open, just zoom out and take a look at Alaska, and you can see in your own mind's eye how the, the mountain belts of Alaska have been deformed in this fashion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And but the, the beautiful thing about this is, you know, I mean, again, you see, here's the slab. That means everywhere above a slab must be an arc. So you know how long this arc, where it all was, and you know what Alaska today looks like, right? It's, so somehow you need to get from here to there. And Stephen yeah. Johnston has basically the only model for this. Um, so we implemented it. But something like that must have happened because we know before yeah. and after. Terrific. Let's keep it going. This is working. I, I think this is totally working. Eric wonders, so the Bonanza slash Coast Plutonic Complex intrusions from the Cascadia route, how do those fit in? Can you repeat that again, please? So there's intrusions in the Bonanza yes, and the Coast Yes, these Bonanza. Uh, and how do those fit into the story? Those are from the Cascadia route? Uh, the, the Bonanza is actually part of the arc that would predate the, uh, well, let, let's just zoom back here. So let's, Let's go back to Bonanza Age, which I think is uh, I don't know, something like that. Ooh, definitely not. Uh, <laughs> We're in the Precambrian. Nice. Um, okay. Oh, we can't actually. We can't go back that far because I don't have I don't have that loaded up. Okay, but Bonanza time is around here. So the uh -huh. Bonanza arc is. Uh, Vancouver Island, and so um, what we're what we would suspect is that in this time frame we have contributions from the west, but potentially contributions from the east as well uh, within this archipelago. So we haven't actually, I mean. People who have worked in the Bonanza specifically, Dante Keneal at the University of Victoria is one. He's he's um, addressed this question of of slab polarity. You know, which way was the ocean lithosphere subducting to form the Bonanza arc? And uh, in his assessment of the geology and other constraints, he doesn't see any clear resolution to that. So the model that we're presenting is we could produce the Bonanza from both westward or eastward subduction. Our pre preference is that it's probably mostly from westward subduction. Hmm. So Basil Tickoff likes 
a big hit of insular from Idaho down to central Mexico at exactly 100 million years ago. Mm -hmm. Is that what your animations are showing as well? No. No, they aren't. They're showing the big crunch is uh, one is about 150 million years ago, which is the Nevada orogeny. And actually, if if we um, I'm just going to pull up another diagram. It's a very busy diagram, but I just wanted maybe we can. I, I, I kind of don't, I definitely don't want to get into this, but what I would like to do <laughs> no, no. <laughs> let's, let's do it. Come on. Just, just the right, if people just, just the right hand, just the right hand side. This is a, this is a, a this is for a publication of, of, of a paper that is not, has not been submitted yet, but, uh, and this, this figure is way too busy, but okay. So what this shows are big plastic aprons that are shed from the emerging uh, um, Rocky Mountains. The PAS uh -huh. are the passage beds. So these are, this is the first time. Okay, so time is, time is in the vertical axis. Yeah. I, and, and so essentially, um, this, if you just uh, divide this by 10, that's the time. So 180 million years, 160, 140, such forth. So what we're looking at here at around 150 million years is the first time we see big flux of sediment into the uh, Western Canadian Interior Basin. And based on DeSalle's work, which is fantastic, we can see that, that the deformation, the frontal thrusts start forming shortly thereafter. These black arrows, this is, this is fault um, gouge dating done by Dinu Panna and, and co-workers. So somewhere around this time is when we think the, the first big crunch happened. Terrible, terrible figure. I shouldn't, I, I feel bad about pulling it up, but no, but that's fun. Just, just to, just to give you an idea that, that it is informed by, you know, by a variety of different data sets. Um, but yeah. we would say this is the big crunch. You know, we'll look at we'll look at maybe we can look at this animation again and go back yeah. to to but, one. But but I mean, Mitch, I mean, would it be fair to say I mean this Nevada orogeny we associate with the first the promontory or the prong of the slab, so it's relatively localized. But around the time that Basil sees his big hit is is really when it runs into a significant amount. What we would say is the Sevier and Canadian Rocky Mountains, where the whole margin more or less. Feels. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So, so you know, we can when we when you. Can so we'd actually like to ask Basil why, what what the Nevada orogeny is for him. I guess would be interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and when when we so so the if we if we go back to about one ten ma, we can actually see that the whole Cordillera margin tightening at this time. So maybe I'll. I'll try to just I'll just go back and forth oh, pause it first at, at this time you can see so can you zoom can you zoom can you zoom into this sure also. yeah, yeah. Let's do that. good idea so the other great thing about G plays is we can actually put our our cursor and get a paleo latitude uh -huh. so we can see that that so this is where the the churn Creek Mount Tatlow would be and we can see that its paleo latitude is uh, is down here, 37 degrees. You can see the, the mouse latitude longitude. So yeah, that's that 37 out. degrees is the paleo latitude at, at 104. Um, so if we look at this period of time, we can see that the whole margin kind of tightens and, and crunches. And, and, you know, part of... It's difficult because we've we've tried to keep our our terrains intact just so they're recognizable through time and and sure. also when you start deforming them that that just increases the amount of of modeling work by an order of magnitude so but you can see that there is another crunch prior to this run everything tightens up right everything tightens up and and then baja bc makes its big makes its big run. So why Maybe you can also comment on your 
on your night on your shearing through the eastern part of the intermontane which is basically the only place left that we can shear now in Baja BC. Yeah, that's right. According to Paleomag. Yeah, so these this what's called it this 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 zone in through here between Stachinia and Quinellia, which is uh, which is an old ocean suture, the Cache Creek terrain. So that's where okay. we would we would focus the the deformation, the offset, uh, <laughs> an area of of very little outcrop constraint. I mean, there is outcrop there, but but it is essentially a a, a, a ancient suture zone, a, a fault zone, which we feel has probably been reactivated. And the other one is is the the area in which we've been mapping recently, which is this this Kootenai terrain, which it's it's also a, a, a major shear zone. Um, so that's where that's where we would focus the motion in to, to accommodate northward translation of Aha BC. But Nick, you can see how at least the intermontane whale, I mean, completely changes shape over time. Yes, yes. That light purple, lightest purple. Right. God, <laughs> viewers, I'm sorry, but this is, I'm just hijacked by this now. I, I, there's, so why would there be two big crunches? Why would there be a 150 million year crunch and then another one at 100? Of the same well, I mean, they, well, well, why they, why is there the second one? I mean, the first one is predicted by the where the plate reconstructions put the continent relative to the slab. So they do this the slab that sticks out to the east, um, and and this independent, you know, where is the continent from Pangaea? That does fit with this 150, 140 of the Nevadan orogeny. So that's good. Um, then taking the Canadian Rocky Mountains and Seville event, um, why that is so discreet is a bit, I mean, we have some, we have some speculations, but it, we also don't know if we're starting to overinterpret the slabs so. Yeah. Yeah. But it's clear well, that it's clear that the longer this goes, the, the more contact, uh, is made with these arcs up and down the margin. So. Yeah. It's clear that there should be more orogenies as more terrains are hoovered up. Okay, viewers, I'm coming back to you. These guys don't have unlimited time. I mean, come on. We'll do, we'll do uh, how about four more questions, you guys, and then I, I'll, I'll, I'll thank you for all this generosity. Charles wonders, where in the animation does the Mount Stewart batholith occur? Like, oh, yeah. I, I mean, either one, uh, Mitch, but like, you know, I, I did that last interview with Merle Beck last summer, and yes. he said, uh, you know, I didn't even really think about all these other terrains surrounding Mount Stewart. Now I'm wondering if Mount Stewart actually formed out in the ocean somewhere. <laughs> like, he was, like, totally. And so it would help be helpful to bring in whatever. And can you just get us onto Mount Stewart and just follow it through your animation? Yeah, well, Nick, you're... you're uh, so it, it's going to be in here somewhere, right? You're you're around here. So this is the these are the blue mountains. Um, Can you zoom in a little? Well, it doesn't. I don't know if it really helps us that much. It's great. Yeah, we're in that vast wasteland. Yep, it's got cool. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's not going to really show up all that well in this animation because we don't capture that, that piece so much. But I guess okay. we're, yeah, we must be in here somewhere. I'm sorry, Nick, I, I, no I, can't, I, I don't know exactly the geology of, around Mount Stewart. Let's just keep rolling. Three more, I promise. Three more and that's it. John says, is Mitch's animation showing the terrain wreck concept that Randy Inkin discussed? That's also coming in the next show. I would, you, would you mind uh, 
just zooming in maybe on Alaska to help kind of set us up for talking to Stephen on Wednesday. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. We're going to keep it going. Two more. Scrolling back, trying to find something decent here. Um, Mr. Tony asks, what's the process for updating these animations as new and various data comes in? Like, it, it's very tedious, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because as you can imagine, if you change one terrain, that change basically has a domino effect and, and you affect all the other terrains. And now, mm -hmm. G-Plates does have facilities that make you know that process a little less painful but essentially everything on the surface of the globe is connected and and the ripple effect can be can be large okay i'm going to take the last question sorry viewers it's always bothered me that there's so much ophiolite at least in my neighborhood and I cannot see how that ophiolite is up here in central Washington if we have eastward subduction. So how does the westward subduction model make it easier to explain how you get this ophiolite material on North America's continental material? Well, I think the people who advocate eastward subduction have lots of ways of explaining it. They do? Okay. And, and it, that, that has been and still is sort of the consensus opinion, right? That it's, it's formed by eastward subduction. There, there are ways of, of doing that that have, been, that have been, you know, offered in the past. And, and but what, what are we, Mitch, so what is, is this? I mean, we, 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 we have nothing but eastward subduction for you, um, Nick, sorry. Um, where you are, it was just always eastward subduction forever. Yeah, so it's a very solid story, I think. But uh, <laughs> so I think wait, so wait, that's what wait. at my latitude, you don't have any westward subduction. Oh, it's not a, not a, not a question of latitude so much, but it's just um, well. Okay, so how should we put that? Well, of course, um, no, no, I. Sh I'm saying your ophiolite, I expect, will be eastward subduction. It's not true that, because 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 when, well, okay, Mitch can Mitch can okay. This is this is first order physics, right? I, reasoning, but I mean, this Farallon slab is 180 million years going, and it's sitting offshore in the ocean, but it's making its thing, and it, around 60 or 50 million years, it accretes to where you are. So if that ophiolite had already, if that subduction complex had formed, then it would have just been added to your margin. Hmm. But maybe where, maybe it also came from the south. Mitch can comment on that. I mean, I think it's part of insular. I think that, that's kind of where what we've been going with. Where uh, did you get 30, it? Uh, just right next to Mount Stewart Batholith, just, just north of Ellensburg, Washington. And it's I, I view it as part of the insular super terrain and, and uh, okay. whatever. I didn't mean to end with a curveball, but like, <laughs> I well, guess I did. We should have, should have asked that question first. Where did you get it? <laughs> I, should have, I, sh I should have brushed up on your geology. My, my expertise uh, is limited to north of 49 degrees, of course. Yeah. And I, yeah. I, I mean, we've, we've done a lot of reading of, of Geo about geology in in the U.S., but but really are you know rely on on the observations that have been carefully recorded by others. Yeah. The the interpretation is is another matter, and and um, you know we we've been following the, the very large shoes of people like Eldridge Moores, and 
uh, have embraced this idea of, of an archipelago and feel that you know it's it's compellingly uh, demonstrated in, by the the fabrics that we see in the mantle, and that is a totally separate data set, separate from paleomag, separate from geology, and that that it's converging on the same solution is remarkable. In, but in Mitch, I mean, isn't the question here not what's the southern end of, or what, how much of Rangelia is still left behind in where Nick is or not? Yeah, I, I'm, let's just see here. So Nick, can you can you just can you locate us on this map, Nick? Where where are you? Sure, I'm uh, right at the top of the north edge of the gray, just as you get into that yellow, kind of just to the just to the west of there. Right here. Yeah, right right in there. Yes. Okay, so that's southern. That, so so that would be part of the insular super terrain mm -hmm. in our in our reckoning and the way that that the the train map plays out here. So I suppose you're right then it is, then it would have maybe been westward subduction. I mean, there was uh, westward subduction there. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I'm just going to continue to read those papers of you guys. I just, I'm just going to keep going every six months and I'm going to get more every time. And especially as I continue to visit with folks for the rest of this alphabet, that's kind of what we're doing here. Like we float some things out and you guys are such good sports. Like sometimes they're dead ends. You're like, what are you, what are you talking about? And sometimes it's like, Oh yeah, we, we definitely have something to go there. So, and the next time we'll have a, somebody who watched this show and, and want to follow up on it. So that's a fun part of this series for sure. But that's, that's plenty. You guys have been on screen for more than an hour. I think that's a record. So, I mean, thank you so much for this. This is like just, incredible and i i so value the work that you guys are doing and mitch in particular is just great to meet you for the first time so thanks to both of you for, for well, joining thanks us for, today. for having us nick <laughs> yeah i mean it's, right. it's really you know it's really it's really amazing how um yeah the high the very high level at which you're discussing things here with thousands of you know, somewhat experts, non-experts, real experts, and and it's just uh, it's just getting somewhere. It's very good, very good. It's it really made fun. us. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. We'll see you guys next time, whenever that happens to be. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll see you. Bye Goodbye. Thank you, Nick. Bye. That was Karin Siglock from CNRS Geo Azure and the University of Côte d'Azur in the south of France near Cannes and Mitch Mahalonuk from British Columbia Geological Survey. I mean, I'm going to watch that four more times in replay. Maybe you'll watch more than once again in the replay. There was a lot there. I grasped some of it. I'm not kidding when I just say I'm going to keep going with these things. I, just, I have to keep, for me personally, uh, the animations, the slides, the papers, just going back and forth. There is a lot there, of course, and I have really no idea where you are at the moment spiritually, but uh, I can only speak personally for myself. It is kind of a blast of stuff, uh, and I can only process it if I, if I revisit, and I revisit, and I revisit, just, just for my own brain. Um, what did I have them on? Those guys were with us for more than an hour, right? Didn't I get them on at like quarter after? 
So like I abused that for sure. Um, let's go to the laptop. I'll show you the papers that I have. Uh, Karin suggested a couple, so I wanted to make sure I include those. And I, yeah, I have a couple uh, slides that um, might help us as well, just in the aftermath of this. But wow, what a treat to be with those guys. Jeez. Um, all right. So nicksentner.com, Baja, click on it in the upper right. Um, I didn't even ask for permission, but since Karen uh, shared her slides last year, I just reposted them. So if you're wanting um, you know, to look frame by frame at these snapshots in time, especially if I come down here, come on, baby, come on, baby. Close your eyes if you're going to get seasick. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I mean, all these slides are here. Yeah, here, this kind of thing where you can literally advance slide by slide and see North America drifting over these lower mantle slabs. I think there's like, what are there? Like more than 150 slides that Karn uh, put in a PDF for us. So those are all there for you. Uh, that was last winter's, almost to the day, last January's Karn appearance. And then I don't have the animation for you, but here's a paper by Edward Clinet, a master's student of Karin, uh, when they were both at, at Oxford. And um, I don't know. I don't know how to share the animation with you. Uh, maybe somebody has it on a link. They can, they can email me. Going back in time, this, yeah. Well... We referred to the major paper of 2017. This is the Karn and Mitch paper that really gave all the detailed geologic context for our discussion today. So if your mind is swimming, maybe it will continue to swim if you go to this, but maybe not. Maybe, maybe you'll be able to uh, grasp some things. There are some of these things that Mitch was sharing with us today. But Karin suggested that I uh, share this. I wasn't sure I was going to, but so here's a paper in 2019 uh, by Terry Pavlis and Amato and Trop and Ridgeway and Rusky and Gerals. Basically um, kind of uh, saying, hey, I think we really need a lot of eastward subduction along the margin of North America. And all this westward subduction stuff is uh, is maybe not the way to go. And then I don't know if you're aware of this, but you can be a, an author of a paper that is kind of being put to question, and then you can reply. It's called a comment. And so here's Karin and Mitch in 2020 replying to the Pavlis 19, uh, 2019 paper. And... Uh, they're kind of pissed <laughs> and saying you missed the point of what we were doing. And here's some details on, um, on, on why our, our story uh, has merit. So, and, and they're short papers to maybe give. So I think Karin by email said, you know, maybe this would be good for your viewers to just kind of get a, an abridged version of, of the arguments going on, the discussions going on. Okay, enough of that. Let's go to uh, a little bit of follow-up from last show, and then uh, I promise I'm not going to go into 30 minutes here, but uh, here's Randy Inken from the last show giving us the mega whale. <laughs> so thrilled to see him do that. And remember, Randy Inken wants this, uh, this insular and intermontane joined at the hip, and Here's a photo from, from Randy. Uh, Randy in his earlier days, 2010, Ted Irving uh, and Judith Baker. Uh, so British Columbia, uh, sorry, uh, Canadian Geological Survey. There's a little higher quality version of Ted's uh, bookcase that, uh, or Randy's bookcase that includes most of Ted's bound paleomag works. And then 
I'm reminding you of what we've been doing the last handful of shows where we're taking the paleomag from individual places within insular and intermontane and uh, trying to focus on them. Uh, from Randy as well, looking at getting to the east, and we touched on that a little bit today. Now we enter Karn and Mitch land. I guess the purpose of this is just to, I don't know, pull back a little bit and just try to reconnect you if you got lost with a couple things I was trying to do uh, at the beginning of this episode. Here's these technicolor poopy piles down in the lower mantle between 1,000 and 2,000 kilometers depth. They are beheaded. Why are they beheaded? Why don't they continue all the way up? I still really love this model where a fixed insular and in North America, way off to the east, and ocean crust in the Mescalera is subducting westwardly underneath a fixed insular and having it pile up. That continues until when? I thought until 100 million years ago. Now, I guess we heard that it's more like 150 million years ago where we first have a crunch. But the concept that I think is satisfying and intuitive is that when you bring North America in and you slam it in to insular, insular suddenly going to move because it got removed from its ribbon candy. And so here's Insular now uh, hanging, uh, joining a ride on the windshield of North America. And I'm just noticing another little thing here. I'm not sure what that is. Is that the fork of the California area? Wow. But the concept is we can time the collision at the surface when we decapitate the poopy pile. Instead of ribbon candy, you can use this off a playground slide. Oh, forgot I had it, same idea here. And we didn't touch on it a whole lot, but a big argument against this model is that you need eastward subduction during this whole story here. And I'm still fuzzy. I didn't want to go there today, but I'm still fuzzy. I'm, what did Karin say? It's, it's a short window that you do have eastward. I have, I have skip it. I have to listen again. If you get North America 160 million years ago, way back east, here's our fixed trenches where Karn today said you, you need you need an island arc. You, you need a microcontinent or an island arc of some sort. And these little teeth here are talking about the angle that the subduction is happening. Another look at what um, is one of their hallmark images. I don't know how you feel about it, but to me, you can take Australia and on a map that looks familiar to us today and you take this box and you turn it 90 degrees and it's, it's an almost perfect analog to what North America was like plowing into this fixed archipelago. These are all coming from these selected papers waiting for you at nickzentner.com. Enter the promo code. Sorry, Patrick. All right. I think, I think it's overkill at this point. Oh, no, it's not. So we didn't get here, but I'm guessing, I'm guessing this may. Okay. Not quite done with the laptop, but let me check in with you first of all. It's a thrill to visit with all these folks live. I'm doing my best to look into this black dot. 
first of all. When I talk to them, I want them to talk to a person. And I think the conversation goes best if I'm looking right into their eyes. Well, I can't see them. They're over here, but I'm looking into this black dot. Okay, fine. So I'm listening as hard as I can because I'm kind of blind looking into this black dot. And I try occasionally not to uh, derail too much, but I know the next show coming or the next show after that. And so occasionally I'll try to steer a little bit because I know the series is going to continue and I know this might come up. Well, here's a slide that's probably going to be uh, setting us up for uh, the next few episodes. This suture, I, I'm still not sure I'm even reading this correctly, but this is the state of California. Remember we talk about the Klamath Mountains, this, the Klamath Siskiyous? and how Basil commented that this is such a weird place. And here's the Sierra Nevada batholith, but there's all sorts of scraps of exotic terrains in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada batholith. Well, you can read as well as I, but I think the idea is that you've got a suture with ophiolites where you close the Mescalera Basin and you crunch it all down like in a trash compactor down to a little spot like this or like this. Now, am I going too far to say that this stuff west of the suture can be totally different age and totally different story than the stuff on the other side of the suture? I think that's what that means, doesn't it? And if we go back in time, we get this stuff out in the ocean, and this is North America proper, and then that vast ocean between insular and North America is, is crunched down to a, a single purple line going through the kind of foothills of driving up to Yosemite Park? I guess so. And so... Are we doing major Baja BC motion? Like, is, is, do we have a major fault running through that suture? Like, is, are there two major stories in this purple line or this orange line? Can you see why I just keep coming back and trying to read these things over and over again? And, and if, if this is real, where does it go north? Did, did Mitch say Cash Creek? Uh, whatever. I think you get the idea that there's different data sets and this, this data set just is totally by itself. If it was just Karin, it would be a totally isolated uh, data set, I think. And, and, and maybe, I don't know, maybe really ignored. I'm just, I'm just spitballing now. Now she's collaborating and has been for 15 years with a field geologist who knows British Columbia well, as she said, Canadian, so that's where the terrains are now. And that's way more attractive to me, that there's this check between the deep mantle and the surface. But I, I don't understand why uh, it hasn't, uh, what did Bezos say when he first published the hit and run? It didn't take, or it didn't, it didn't have legs or something like that. I can't quite tell, but the folks that I visit with on camera and off, I, it doesn't seem like this stuff has taken off. It's not, and I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't understand why. All right. It's almost 11 o'clock for crying out loud. A toast to you. Here's to you for watching this episode. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your continued interest in all that's going on in this series. And here we are late in the alphabet and almost every episode is a totally different person with a totally different approach. And it, I suppose it's a little hard to keep up, but you're keeping up. So you know what? I'm going to toast you again. Here's another toast to you. Here's a toast to Karin Siglock, who I see is still in the green room watching right now. <laughs>
Here's to Karin for joining us on a Saturday night in the south of France. Here's to Mitch Mahalanik, who joined us for the first time. Thoroughly enjoyed him, not only his expertise, but his ability to share those visuals with us as well. Thank you, Mitch. Here's to you. And it's time to, it's time to stop. It's time to stop. Thank you, dear viewer. The next time that I see you, will be Wednesday, January 25th at 2 o'clock Pacific time with Stephen Johnston, who I met for the first time testing some technology a couple mornings ago. Really enjoyed chatting with him, and I'm sure that you will enjoy his talk about the Ribbon Continent and the Great Alaskan Terrain Wreck. Thank you. I love you. And goodbye from Ellensburg, Washington, USA.